Hi, uh, Dave. Welcome to uh, 11th USA India Business Summit and 26th Georgia Tech Global Business Forum. I really appreciate your partnership and sponsorship as well as your presentation. You've been a, a continued partner and we really appreciate it. And uh, title of your presentation is Lessons Learned So Far From a Global Pandemic. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ani. And uh... Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, so my name is Dave Ahuja. Uh, to start with an introduction, I am uh, the Chief Financial Officer for Novalis. And I'm really delighted to be with all of you this morning, virtually, of course, and hope that all of you are staying safe and healthy in the middle of these uh, pandemic times. Uh, it has been an extremely challenging year and uh, like uh, a lot of uh, uh, companies, we have navigated through these uncertain times and we have also learned uh, very valuable lessons on how we can continue to drive our business forward uh, during these uh, tumultuous uncertain times and uh, today I look forward to sharing uh, some of our lessons learned during this time. Uh, so if I go to the next slide, for those of you who may not be familiar with Novellis, I'll start first by providing a bit of background on the company. We are, lead we are leaders in the flat rolled aluminum space and we are the world's largest recyclers of aluminum. We employ 15,000 people across 33 operating locations in nine countries and our annual revenues are in the vicinity of $12 billion. And we are headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia with operations in North and South America, Europe, and Asia. And Novellis has strategically chosen the Southeast US, specifically Atlanta, as our strategic global headquarters because of the accessibility of its excellent airport hub, as well as the educational and research institutions that provide access to talent. And to top it all, it's an outstanding quality of life. We have centered our manufacturing footprint across the Southeast to leverage highly skilled workers and to be close to our customers who have continued to build operations in the region. If I just talk about some of our key statistics by geographies across the world, in North America, we have approximately 4,900 employees across 16 operations. In South America, we have approximately 1,600 employees across two locations. In Europe, we have approximately 6,200 employees across 11 locations. And in Asia, we have 2,000 employees across four operations. So a very widespread of operation. We are also a leader in sustainability and recycling. Last year, our products contained 59% content of recycled materials, recycled aluminum. We recycle 74 billion used beverage cans globally each year. We are able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 95% when using recycled aluminum versus primary aluminum. And our sustainability efforts actually go beyond just the environmental impacts. We are committed to building a sustainable business that supports our employee and the communities where we live and operate. Moving to the next slide. One of the keys to a sustainable business is having a strong financial profile. And I'm proud that ours is the strongest in the aluminum industry. Through the end of our last fiscal year, we delivered four straight years 
of record performance, record financial performance, which has enabled us to manage the COVID-19 pandemic and maintain very strong liquidity levels. As you will see, uh, some of the key financials for the last for the last fiscal year on the screen, we have had an extremely robust uh, set of financial numbers, uh, which actually was great uh, as we stepped into the pandemic. Moving to the next slide. More important to our success though, is the success of our diverse and expansive customer base. Across our four key business segments of beverage can, automotive, aerospace, and specialties, our customers are the most leading brands across the world. We strive to provide innovative aluminum solutions with high recycle content that create more sustainable beverage packages, lighter, more efficient vehicles and airplanes, and better consumer electronics and building products. The beverage can market represents the largest amount of Novalis shipments today and includes customers such as Coke, Crown, Ball Corporation, and Hauser Bush, just amongst a few. Automotive is the largest growing market for Novalis. Automakers are increasing the use of aluminum in vehicles to make them more sustainable. And we have established closed loop recycling systems with many of our customers. Our automotive customers include Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, Jaguar Land Rover, Mercedes-Benz, Audi, Tesla, Neo, and many more. Our aerospace business includes customers such as Airbus, Boeing, Bombardier, and Embraer. Lastly, our specialty products are also a growing market for Novalis. More designers and engineers prefer to use our aluminum to reduce the weight of electronic devices, design corrosion resistant buildings, and create more sustainable packaging like coffee capsules. Our customers in this segment include LG and Samsung, packaging customers like Pactive Corporation and Nespresso, that is Nestle, and building and construction companies like Velux. Our mission is, turning to the next slide, our mission is shaping a sustainable world together. As you can see in our mission statement, we shape innovations that move us towards what is next. Sustainability forms the core of our operations and it is the way we do business. And when we work together and build on our collective intelligence, we are capable of shaping a world that sustains us all. Moving to the next slide. As many of you know, Novalis has strong and deep connections to India. Novalis is a subsidiary of Hindalco Industries Limited, a leader in the aluminum and copper industries and the metals flagship of the other Birla group based in Mumbai. It is with their steadfast support and strategic investments that Novalis has become a world leader in the aluminum industry. We are also closely aligned with the other Tiberla Group's cultural values and vision, underscoring an enduring passion for work, entrepreneurial spirit, and the highest ethical standards. And like our parent, we care deeply about our communities and believe it is our duty to facilitate inclusive, sustainable growth by investing and volunteering our time and resources in the regions where we live and operate. Now turning to the next slide. So as you can see, and I'm sure many of you have experienced, our business was flourishing until the pandemic hit. And I don't have to tell you that the world did not know what hit it, but businesses had to respond very rapidly. 
the onset of COVID-19 as a global pandemic was an initial shock to the system and a disruptor to all aspects of the supply chain. And while we had a robust ERM that provided plans for an economic downturn, nuclear war, or even tsunamis, global pandemic was nowhere to be found. Nobody had anticip anticipated that something as big as this, as disruptive as this was just about to hit the world. And like everyone, we had to adapt and adjust very, very quickly. So turning to the next slide, how did we mobilize ourselves to handle this crisis? And the key to our success was that we prepared for the worst and were ready for the best, which is that we have seen a sharp recovery in the market after the April-June period, which was the lowest point uh, during the lockdowns, uh, the, the following quarter, uh, July, September, has seen uh, a sharp recovery and we were ready for that as well. And our preparation and execution centered around six key strategic drivers. So if we turn to the next slide, what were these key drivers? Number one, safety, protecting our people and our operations, strong financial management, protecting the health of our business, technology, leveraging technology to keep our businesses running, collaboration, partnering with each other and our customers in new ways to continue to serve their needs. Culture, operating with our purpose top of mind to guide our decisions. Community, continuing to support the communities where we live and work. And I will speak a bit about each of these in, in a little more detail now. So turning to the next slide, starting with safety. The safety of our employees was our top priority. Novalis quickly stood up as a team to deal with the crisis across the company's global operations, business lines, and functions. In February, to combat this outbreak, Novellis activated its global crisis core team to ensure that we had a coordinated and holistic approach across all Novellis regions and facilities to effectively respond to the evolving COVID-19 situation. We also had good intelligence from our operations in Asia, helping us anticipate our safety and operational needs in Europe, North America, and South America, given that Asia was the first one to get into COVID and also to come out of it. Best practices were already being shared across regions as early as February and continue to happen today. Moving to the next slide and continuing on safety. Since the pandemic began, we have taken a broad range of measures and actions to help stem the spread of the virus to ensure our people and plants remain safe. Visitor restrictions and virtual technologies have become new ways of doing business. We instituted global travel restrictions, work from home arrangements, and updates to our corporate and regional pandemic plans. And more importantly, we conducted daily cleaning and sterilization of sites and expanded hygiene measures, including temperature checks of our employees, business essential visitors, truck drivers, and anyone entering our sites. And the working group continues to address issues on an ongoing basis as they arise and look to reduce the number of cases impacting our employees, which we have done very successfully. Now turning to the next point, which is on financial management. So I'll wait for the slide to turn. So second to the health and safety of our employees is the health of our business, which is why we've been working so hard to identify cost savings and capex deferrals while maintaining strong liquidity levels. Despite a strong financial profile, Within the first days of customer shutdowns, we worked quickly 
to identify more than $250 million in cost savings and $100 million in capital expenditure deferrals. And it wasn't just the company that sacrificed. Our employees have also helped carry the burden, which is why we have been able to protect employment levels and avoid any layoffs. I'm incredibly grateful for that. And that speaks to the character of our people and my colleagues. Turning to the next slide, which is technology. So with a plan to protect our employees and our business, we turn to how we were going to continue to operate in a virtual world and serve our customers. Technology proved to be a critical need to continuing our operations, both in the corporate functions and on the shop floor. While we had not worked in a virtual setting previously, and there were questions about how our infrastructure and employees would be impacted, we have adapted well and leveraging opportunities that did not exist before. I mean, one of the highlights of, of, uh, of the remote working was that we even completed and closed an acquisition uh, in the month of April, right in the middle of the pandemic and have started doing the integration all virtually. And it is really thanks to technology uh, which has enabled us to do so much beyond what we ever imagined. The next is about collaboration. Technology proved to be a great tool to join us when we physically couldn't be together. We learned quickly that we needed to collaborate more than ever before to meet our customer needs. With customer shutdowns, reopenings, and changing production schedules, delivering products on time and in full, was really challenging, but we worked with our customers closer than we ever have before to establish shared objectives and communicated more than ever to manage their expectations and meet their needs. And we have been very successful in maintaining high levels of customer satisfaction, almost at similar levels to what it used to be before the pandemic. Going to the next slide, this is about culture. We were able to do this by learning on, uh, about our strong culture, by leaning on our strong culture. Safety, collaboration, transparency, and respect are not just aspirations. They are fundamental to who we are as an organization, and it's the way we serve our customers. I believe strongly that the reason we are successful is in part because of our colleagues who live these values every day. They care for one another and for our customers. It is our strong culture and purpose that has led us through this pandemic and hopefully made us a better organization than before. Moving to the next slide. Our strong culture can be traced directly back to the other Birla group and specifically their commitment to keeping people and communities healthy and safe. As ABG has, we have made financial and in-kind donations to causes that are committed to helping those most adversely affected by COVID-19 while still maintaining our annual charitable commitments to organizations like Habitat for Humanity and others. Regional and local teams have supported schools hospitals and community organizations with money and resources. And our team in South America used our aluminum material to build much needed ventilator stands, a great example of living our culture. We realized the only way to manage through this global pandemic is to do it together. Our colleagues, our customers and our partners working together during these challenging times. So with that, I'll close by saying, certainly the future remains uncertain, but with a smart strategic plan, we can overcome these challenging times. At Novellis, we will continue to focus on these strategic drivers to protect our people and our business, but also drive value to our customers, colleagues, and communities. And with that, uh, thank you for having me, and I'm happy to take any questions now.
Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. Stuart, welcome. Just a brief introduction. Uh, some of you uh, may have heard uh, about a year ago when we presented, but uh, my name is Stuart Countess. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Kia plant that's located in West Point, Georgia. Um, we manufacture three different vehicles uh, at this facility, uh, the Kia Telluride, the Kia Sorento, and the Kia K5, uh, which used to be known as the uh, Optima. Uh, we're a three shift operation. We run five days a week, uh, 2,700 employees, and uh, we are the uh, sole manufacturing site uh, inside the United States uh, for Kia. Uh, we supply about 40% of the volume of Kia sold within the uh, North American region. So what today uh, we are going to uh, focus on is this topic about the growth of the uh, manufacturing segment and in our case specifically the automotive sector in the Southeast region. So there's four topics that uh, we think are uh, have some very interesting information and it will talk about the automotive growth projections not only within the southeast but certainly within the uh, state of georgia um, what are those opportunities in the southeastern united states certainly again how does it impact uh, georgia as a state and then what are these business opportunities that come about so looking first at the automotive growth, um, some perspective, international OEMs um, represent a growing presence within the U.S. There are 30 different manufacturing facilities across the U.S. representing $92 billion in investment. When you compare the international uh, automotive manufacturers with the traditional uh, big three, Ford, GM, and now Fiat Chrysler, 47% of the total sales within the U.S. and manufacturing volume within the U.S. is represented by these international automakers. Collectively, uh, there's 136,000 people uh, employed to support that as uh, automotive, automotive manufacturing employees. We certainly are in a changing market. Um, as we continually see uh, in the news and with technology growths, um, you have the development of electric, autonomous, and then now a lot of discussion and development work being done around air mobility as another means of transportation. There are shifting consumer habits um, that we are each uh, reconfiguring our businesses and accepting as challenges. Um, these can include uh, alternative power vehicles in a number of different areas. Uh, we have now ride sharing uh, from the Uber and these other um, modes of transportation. And then certainly specialty vehicles that support many different areas within the uh, economy. From a sales perspective um, in they're looking at about 16.5 million cars uh, being sold in the U.S. for 2025. 2020, obviously, with COVID, uh, took a significant hit. Uh, we were anticipating somewhere in that 16.5 million range. But right now, um, after many of the OEMs being shut down for extended periods of time due to the uh, pandemic, we're running at about 11.9 million cars uh, for this year. One of the up and coming sectors certainly is the uh, alternative vehicle sales. And that is projected to increase by 154% from 2019 through 2025. A number of different OEMs um, are at different levels meaning where they are from a development to a manufacturing point. Um, some have come out, uh, begun the conversion of some of their facilities already to uh, some type of alternative uh, in internal combustion engine source. Um, and then some are still in the planning and development processes. Um, autonomous vehicles replacing uh, tr uh, traditional um, power autos it's about 10% from uh, 2019 
and anticipated to grow into the 21% range by 2025. Looking at international trade, um, we've seen a repatriation of US-based companies. Likewise, we've also seen resourcing of US companies. Um, these supplier locations have relocated to the US to get more, um, or to get to a closer proximity to their individual plant that they're delivering to, uh, which has been good for our business, um, but it also has presented certainly its own set of challenges. And then lastly, in the international trade is the new startup companies. Um, and there are a number of them that are currently working on uh, different types of vehicles. Um, you can see more public announcements with companies like Rivion, but there are also a number of other um, smaller operations that um, also are working to not only seek uh, partners, but also selling their technologies to then last thing on the automotive growth, it's really become a very interesting point over the last couple of years, but has um, become quite a uh, interesting challenge since uh, its implementation in July is USMCA. So with the NAFTA being um, closed out and USMCA being developed, um, that has also created its own set of challenges, not only from an OEM point of view, but from the supply base point of view, where and who, where your parts are coming from to support this. There's new government governance and regulation behind it. Much of that still being worked out um, through the administration. Um, there's changes in business cases, which is impacting also not only where future de uh, development of product and supply locations. And then it also has an impact on the global economy fluctuation as people try to meet the standards that have been um, agreed between the US, Canada and Mexico. Next. So from an advanced manufacturing point of view, um, in engineering and design, Cars have uh, had a much shorter model life um, than in past. Used, used to years ago, a car was about eight years old before you completely redeveloped it. Now that lifetime span has been shortened somewhere in the five to six year range. Well, that puts a lot of pressure um, also on your development cycle as you consider new technologies um, and advancements that uh, have to be certainly uh, validated prior to implementation. It has, however, created a more versatile and flexible manufacturing model. So there's a lot of platform manufacturing um, that has been the trend over the last years, but it uh, is also growing um, so that you can build many different models based off a similar platform uh, from a vehicle point of view. And then alternative material usage and manage, uh, management um, one of the growing things, certainly, uh, if you look at um, miles per gallon of vehicles as we try to hit um, these ever changing standards, is the incorporation of different materials in order to make the vehicle lighter so that you can meet these new uh, guidelines. Then you have the environmental impacts. Um, as everyone is trying to minimize their waste um, and contribution to the uh, environment um, that continues to be a major focus on all of the OEMs. On the support systems, the supply chain uh, is very uh, complex. Uh, not only do you have supply chains in your local area, but certainly you have suppliers throughout the entire world, which are certainly impacted through all the different trade agreements uh, that we continually hear about. Um, it has required them, the, being the suppliers, to have more storage and conveyance systems, but it's also brought about a lot of discussion as the complexity of vehicles increases, even with the new technology and how you do kitting and sequencing to minimize the impact to your overall manufacturing uh, system. That also brings about logistics technology. And what does that do from a material handling and delivery point, um, be it vehicles inside the facility that run on uh, 
some type of a rail that delivers parts to the line on a just-in-time basis. All of these things are be having to be rethought as, again, the vehicles are more complex and we can't store as many parts um, at line side. From a data management point of view, um, it's about inventory and production and then certainly the quality systems. So this fits into a lot of the, uh, the data concepts and how you use that data to drive your next decisions. But in, from a warranty point of view and looking into the future with uh, the customers, it gives us some predictability about where um, we need to take special attention to increasing not only the product that is being built, but what are we going to do for the product that's coming behind it. The supplier needs um, also are continually changing. It's about sourcing and location. Um, this, as I'd said before, is due to uh, the trade environment that we're living under. Um, do you have dedicated versus shared supply networks? Um, you have companies that have multiple plant locations and they may even have similar to Hyundai and Kia as they are sister companies, um, you have shared supplier networks. But it also brings about information security in this day and age when uh, we have to be very careful with what that information that is being uh, sent out. So from a challenge point of view, and especially in some of the areas within the Southeast, um, we hear a lot of discussion about rural broadband and availability, um, in particular Georgia, um, Southwest Georgia, certainly trying to grow that environment. Um, and they are always interested in having companies or manufacturing businesses locate there. But you have some infrastructure problems that we also have to address in order to make those opportunities available. Then lastly listed here is the committed road and rail traffic limitations. Um, from a rail point of view, um, you export at least from this particular facility, about 60, 55 to 60% of our product uh, goes out by rail. And it goes, of course, all over the country. Um, but you have to make careful planning about how and where these uh, points of, of uh, hubs are for these rail systems in order to uh, get your product to your end consumer on time. The uh, counter side of that is, in your certain regions and in certainly with Kia, uh, we deliver our products into the Southeast region uh, via trucks. That too also is now got its own set of challenges with new rules and regulations about the number of hours that um, individuals are available to drive on the roads. And certainly with driving on the roads, you're looking to how to maximize um, the impact without creating too many other issues. Some other things that we've looked at and continue to look at within Georgia and its infrastructure, you certainly have the airport, but we are located um, within great proximity to the Port of Savannah. And so there's lots of opportunities also um, to explore how you get your materials that are coming in from various locations, but also trying to minimize the uh, traffic impacts to the local areas. Next. So specifically in the Southeast um, and in Georgia, um, in the Southeast, there are currently 13 manufacturing facilities across seven states. Um, those OEMs represent not only Kia, Hyundai, Toyota, Mercedes, uh, Nissan, um, BMW. So there, there's quite a wide variety um, of different companies that have located to the United States or into the Southeast region. Um, that represents eight international OEM brands uh, within the Southeast. Uh, we're the youngest uh, by far that's uh, joined in this area. Um, and then you start seeing some other areas where there's potentials that uh, you talk about joint ventures and then diversities and vehicle styles um, and meaning is a plant more an SUV plant or is it more of a sedan type plant? So there's a lot of uh, growth and opportunity in that area. What is the attraction to Georgia? 
Um, it's, it has a fantastic network of available state resources from the airport to the ports. Um, all of those are extremely important when you're trying to move the volume of materials to make a, a product such as ours. But Georgia also operate, has a great advantage in the public and pri private partnerships that it uh, works on. Their chambers of commerce are heavily supporting uh, growth and business within the state of Georgia. Uh, we as a company are heavily involved with them. Um, it's, it's helped certainly West, rural West Georgia, um, which used to be a textile community, help them to grow into a completely different uh, set of uh, industry standards. You look at not only what is what are we doing, but it's the supply base that we bring with it. So I had said previously, we were at 2,700 um, employees here, but when you extend out into the supply base and the other networks to support us, you're adding anywhere from 12 to 14,000 additional positions in the local area. But what is also important that we feel is how do we integrate ourselves within the community development? We focus in a couple of areas, one of which is education. Um, how do you grow the talent within the local area? So not only working with the state technical college system uh, to develop training and certification type programs that benefit our particular industry, but it also would benefit other growth areas, especially when you look at the areas in, such as maintenance. We have also extended ourselves into the local high school system. Um, as we feel that the high school system is certainly that workforce of the future, and we've had great success in doing that. I had mentioned previously about the capable infrastructure. These just highlight those same exact areas. Um, Georgia also does have a very sophisticated rail system that helps support us. And then one of the growing things that Georgia has done is what's called an inland port strategy. Um, they've had some great success in moving um, materials from the Port of Savannah to other more central regions that help make uh, the manufacturing companies in that area have easier accessibility to uh, their particular products. And then lastly, workforce development. Uh, Georgia Quick Start is ranked as the number one um, training development program for a workforce for the last six or seven years, and it continues to supply manufacturing in Georgia with a distinct advantage. This also fits well within the college and career academies that have been developed. And as I'd said previously about the technical college backup uh, college systems of Georgia and how individual manufacturing companies can continue to work with them and develop curriculums to help um, support their overall workforce. Next. So the opportunities uh, we see are quite abundant. Um, there is technology changes in this world but as we see every day. Our big question is how do we support that growth and what does it mean to our individual facility? We have to remain adaptable and flexible um, in our solutions to manufacturing. Um, the comment is made that 20 is the new 50 because it's no longer this long-term planning. Um, you're looking at much shorter time spans but with an ever-changing workforce, you're having to meet the employee expectations. The technology improvement, and I'll just cover a couple of these um, quickly. Um, it is about infrastructure upgrades as we see continuing product changes from connected vehicles to autonomous vehicles. That's gonna have your facility growing. But not only does it change what's inside your facility, but it's a development process for your workforce. That will require more advanced manufacturing applications um, as again, the car is getting uh, more complicated. And then as Dev had said before, uh, we too have learned about how to operate virtually. Um, from a manufacturing site, that's quite a difficult thing because you can't build a car from uh, outside the office, but yet there are some functions that can be done externally and that has challenged us to rethink what and how we handle certain tasks. Skill shifting is still about filling that gap and that goes back to our education and development. Uh, we as a company and we encourage anyone in, uh, in the Southeast and in Georgia is you have to grow your own talent. Um, and 
manufacturing typically has a um, negative con connotation that people think is a very dirty environment and it simply isn't. So you have to um, not only show, but uh, help others realize that there's a great opportunity for a career inside manufacturing. I'll close with that and uh, certainly uh, willing to answer any questions. Thank you, Stuart. I appreciate uh, your presentation and also Dave. So I have a question to both of you. Uh, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on your respective industries? This has been uh, in everybody's mind. So I would let uh, Dave go first. Uh, yes, so the industry has been um, uh, very deeply impacted. And uh, let's see, uh, let's see, you know, what do we mean by, by the industry? Uh, it means different things to different people depending upon what end segments uh, are being catered by which of our players uh, in our industry. So uh, we have been in a very fortunate place because a very good part of the portfolio uh, that we have is beverage cans and beverage cans is counter cyclical. As the pandemic came in, uh, the home consumption went up and uh, you know, therefore the demand for cans uh, basically you know, went up in the US. Uh, if you go to supermarkets, cans are being rationed. You just cannot buy more than a certain number of cans. They are, they are just restricting uh, the number of can products because of the shortage of cans. So, and and uh, in some other markets also like South America, you know, we have seen a surge in demand for cans. So we have been fortunate in that respect. Uh, but uh, the auto industry was in the beginning severely impacted, particularly in the April, June quarter, the, the auto industry took a hit and therefore, uh, you know, that part of the business uh, did take a hit for us as well as our peers, but it's remarkable how that has come back. So I would say it's a bit mixed in the beginning. Uh, there was a big hit and then things swung back uh, like a V-shaped recovery there. So it, it's, it's a kind of a, 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 a kind of a net positive story of how things recovered from it. Uh, the place which was most severely impacted was the aerospace segment. Uh, you know that by all predictions, aerospace demand uh, will take a very long time to come back to the same levels as pre-pandemic. Even after there is a vaccine, even after we come out of the pandemic, uh, travel habits won't jump back to the same level by all predictions. And that part of the business and players who are more exposed to that, uh, luckily for us, it's not a very large part of the volume in our overall business, but that part of the business is pretty severely impacted. And last but not the least was our specialty segment where it's a tale of two cities. Industrial products was impacted because of, because of the slowdown of industrial activity, while things like building and construction, electronics uh, did very well. So overall net net, it's a mixed bag. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Stuart? I would add to a little bit of what exactly what he said. The sales story is really kind of an interesting story. Um, there is no doubt that the month of April and for the most part of the month of May was very, very low. Um, that's where we saw the largest um, decrease in sales. But on the counter side of that, what it did do, and I think was quite interesting, is all this inventory of cars that were at dealerships, et cetera, began to draw down extremely quick. So by the time you were getting to the end of May, there was another crisis on the front, which there were no cars to buy. In the meantime, the consumers out there buying cars, um, not certainly at the rate that they were one year ago, but for the condition that we were in, it was quite amazing um, the ability to maintain some sales. Um, from a Kia's point of view, um, we're less than 10% off, which is not great, but compared to some other individuals that were at 15, 20, 30%, you know, we've been very fortunate. Right. I think the other, there's two other things I'd mention is one, the impacts of COVID on the workforce. Um, Deb's presentation was 
spot on. Um, everything that they were doing is what we were having to do. To say that you could pull that out of a drawer, no. Many of us were having to create that and understand and modify every day uh, what we were doing because you had to make your workers feel safe to be able to come back when the conditions presented themselves. Um, you learn things along the way and you make some adjustments, but even still today with our workforce here, face masks are required 100%, temperature checks, et cetera. None of that we anticipate will change anywhere in the near future. The bigger challenge was on the supply side. When you have the resources to do what uh, Novellus did, what we did, that's one question. But when you're talking about a supply chain that they may or may not have that same set of resources, that's where the real issue becomes uh, difficult. You're dealing not only from within the U.S., but you're also dealing with externally in other countries. And you can't manage what's going on from their local and federal governments. So that puts another set of challenges that each day you're trying to read into a crystal ball what, what they may or may not do. Right. So uh, other thing uh, which is kind of related to both of you as industry leaders, senior executives of big companies, is that there is a growing impetus from the government uh, in the U.S. Uh, about bringing mm -hmm. manufacturing home. You know, uh, you know, we want to create jobs. We want to have self uh, less and less uh, dependence on other countries, or you know, be challenged by sudden supply chain shocks as we experienced in uh, March, April period. Uh, what do you envisage? Uh, what do you think is going to come in future? And it doesn't necessarily have to uh, be your company's point of view, like in your own judgment. Dave? So, uh you know, it's interesting, and, and I have a point of view here, uh, uh, clearly. Uh, so supply chains are built not over months or even years. Supply chains are built over decades. You know, there are centers of excellence. Uh, there are competencies. There is huge capital investments. And, you know, to, to think to think that you can just start moving supply chains, you know, within months, or even years, I mean, it's a bit naive, uh, you know, to, to an extent you can do it. Or in industries where there is low capital investment and there's high flexibility, you can certainly do it. But in the kind of industries where we are or Stuart is, it's easier said than done. And, uh, you know, the cost is tremendous. And these are not industries, you know, where there are such huge margins that you can afford to, you know, sort of just start redoing everything overnight all over again. So, so I'm very skeptical about this whole concept of, you know, supply chains getting localized, uh, you know, just because, uh, uh, just because of a wave of, uh, if I may call it, you know, anti-globalization uh, that has kind of taken over. Uh, I think that it is, it is way more complicated and it won't just happen. I wouldn't disagree with that. I, I think that it's way more complicated than the pundits who just think it's a snap of a finger, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, it's not only relationships, but there's some technical issues that become much bigger than many want to admit. Um, our One of our most recent discussions, especially with USMCA, is about steel. Um, and I'm sure you can appreciate this. There's not enough steel manufacturing plants in the United States right now to make the amount of steel that the automotive industry utilizes. Even if there were, you still have the challenges that that is years of development, dyes made, that can't be just overnight uh, remanufactured. Um, so I think that there's some there's some realization that people are going to have to come to that, you know, we could change a little maybe if that's what we so choose to do, but there's not going to be this huge massive shift at one time. Costs clearly are, are in that. Um, but I do, 
I do think it's going to be interesting over the next six to nine months, depending upon how long this pandemic uh, lasts. I think you're going to see potentially people storing more parts at some point. That's not within our DNA to do that because we're on a very just jet tight world, but to avoid those disruptions and supplies, I will tell you it is being considered. Right. Great. Thank you. Uh, John, are you there? Yes, uh, I am. Okay. Please go ahead. On, uh, yeah. I know that Dev is on a tight schedule. So uh, I'll make my question very short and simple. Are you in both of your uh, company's cases sponsoring uh, apprenticeships to train the generation of uh, future skilled workers? Uh, in principle, we would like to, but I think that it's becoming a bit challenging to actually do that, you know, just given restrictions on travel, just, just given the environment in which we are operating. So it's not like we want to stop anything or that we don't want to do it, but it's just uh, more out of a practical constraint of this remote working where you know, all the logistics about getting, getting candidates, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we introduce them in the system? How do we onboard them uh, with all the remote working challenges? So it's becoming more a practical, a more a practical challenge uh, than, uh, than any kind of a desire to stop anything, you know. I would say that, um, yes, we are continuing in that. Uh, we do it at both levels, from a high school level, but also um, with the technical college system. So they're not working independent of one another. And we've had some very good success stories um, for several kids that are, have now become employees in our maintenance area. Let's see. Do you want to, Annie, do you want to handle some of the questions from the audience? I yeah. have more, which I do, but Dave, uh, I was wondering if you use the same standard globally across your uh, your production manufacturing sites regarding COVID-19, or are you taking a differentiated approach depending on the jurisdiction or the locational site? Well, we basically um, uh, follow the stricter of the guidelines. If the local guidelines are stricter than our standard guidelines, we follow the local guidelines. Otherwise, if the local guidelines are less restrictive, then we follow our more, our more um, uh, you know, stringent guidelines. So that's the general uh, thumb of rule that we, that we use. Great, thank you. Uh, let me ask a question to Stuart. This is from uh, one of our attendees, Mr. Ajay Kohli. Uh, you indicate 20% penetration of autonomous vehicles by 2025. What is the current and anticipated composition of these vehicles? Example, passengers, cars, trucks, etc. Um, it will it will certainly be a mixture within it. Uh, I see a there's a lot of development work going on now about uh, like UPS, FedEx type trucks um, taking more into that market. But I think it can flex. The one big challenge that I see from a, and this is just the way I look at it, we still have an infrastructure issue, um, especially related to electric cars. Um, in certain places, Atlanta is one, there's a lot more accessibility um, to that type of infrastructure. But if you live in West Georgia, rural West Georgia, um, it, is, it doesn't exist. So as a large company um, using it as delivery trucks, yeah, I think you'll find great success and there already is success out there. How quickly the American consumer is going to be willing to move from an internal combustion engine into some other technology, um, I do believe it's still an open question. It all sounds great until you can't, um, you can't move that quickly to whatever your place or destination is. I, I had a question uh, for Stuart. Uh, you chose Georgia, Georgia, Alabama as a location. Has it delivered everything you expected to obtain by the choice of location? 
in terms of production facilities, train workforce, access to markets, transportation system, logistical networks, uh, business climate? I would say everything was exactly what we were looking for. Um, the infrastructure of the state of Georgia, as I'd mentioned, from the port to the airport to the inf um, interstate system and rail systems has all been um, exactly what we were looking for, um, in many cases better. From a workforce point of view, this particular area locating in West Georgia, um, as it used to be a textile community, we had an available workforce. But one of the key things to that was the, the uh, Georgia Quick Start program. And from a manufacturing point of view, and they've ex shown this in numerous examples throughout the state, their ability to train a worker to do the type work, whatever that company is doing, is matched by absolutely no one. Um, and then the same can be said from a supply base point of view. Um, you, you have that you have that support system to make everyone successful. Uh, Ani, do you want to take questions from the audience or do you want me to do it? There is a question from uh, uh, one of our uh, audience members. What are the costs related to repatriation? Uh, in the case of uh, an auto automobile company, uh, I wonder if you could uh, feel that question or... Uh, does it have an impact? The question of repatriation, reshoring, really is what the audience yeah. member means. Yeah, and there are lines and components and parts. I think we're, and this fits a little bit to a previous question, um, as there is certainly a big push to relocate companies back to the U.S., um, whether you agree or disagree with it, there are certainly some limitations. Um, those limitations bec become, just as Dev had said, they're centers of excellence in certain areas. And if you pick that up and take it somewhere else, do you lose something in that transition? Likewise, you still have to deal with, you know, regulatory issues, um, depending upon what you're making. Um, does that fit into the area that you're trying to, uh, to relocate to? Um, is it about moving closer to the plant? What is the cost of that product become? You could put everything around you, but there's probably an argument to be made that uh, you then can make your product so expensive that you become uncompetitive. So you have to make the right set of choices um, so that you can still compete uh, with whoever, whomever your competitor is. The, the production line uh, at uh, the Kia plant in Georgia, is it primarily for U.S. domestic uh, consumption or North American consumption? Or are you uh, basically supplying a broader uh, market globally? So our, our primary uh, customer is certainly the U.S. We do export to Canada and Mexico. Um, and then our Telluride product, we export to the Middle East. So outside North America, that's the major point of uh, exports. And of course, anytime you're doing that, that just gives you another business opportunity to not only grow what you're doing, but work with the mm -hmm. state park, in this case, the Port of Savannah or the Port of Brunswick. Is the revised NAFTA, the U.S., um, Mexico, Canada, agreement uh, beneficial uh, as it improved your ability to function uh, across North America, across the three member states in any way? Uh, I, I would say right now it's certainly in flux. <laughs> the, uh, as I had mentioned before, the, the new governance and regulations um, still being worked on and you have to get three countries to agree to it. So that, that remains an open question at this point. Everyone thinks it's going to certainly be better, but uh, there, there are problems that uh, each company, whether it be in automotive or in other industries, there, there's some questions that we've got to resolve. It's interesting to hear that. Uh, it confirms my, my uh, general view of the matter, but uh, uh, I am sure the future holds a bright horizon line. 
Ani, I believe we have reached the end of the of the time allotted. Right. Uh, you um, know, we uh, we will wait. Uh, we will wait, uh, Stuart. If you are okay on time, we will wait for a minute or so while uh, the next session speakers are joining. There is some uh, link issue with one of them, so uh, please uh, be with us for some time, Stuart. If that's good with you. Yeah. No problem. Okay. All right, John. Yeah. I need a couple of minutes before I onboard everybody else from next session. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'm curious to ask you uh, in terms of uh, recruiting uh, work workforce and staff and managerial uh, skills. Are you uh, are positions open at this time in the Kia environment? Are you anticipating that uh, the uh, your human resources need will shift as we move into 2021 and uh, are he heading towards the end of the uh, global health crisis at some point next year in the second half? Um, we are, yes, to your first question, we, we certainly still are looking for um, certain key positions um, within the company. We do a lot of growing from within, but areas like uh, in the engineering side, typically around the manufacturing process engineering, um, we look a lot to the uh, universities um, and get a lot of great kids out of um, that arena. Um, we have other positions that uh, certainly, yes, we are continually uh, recruiting. Um, and it goes both internal and external. We've had good success growing internally. Um, so we, we would do it in both ways. I think the big challenge, and it goes a little bit to your question, is with these upcoming new technologies, autonomous vehicles, electric cars, mm -hmm. um, that is a next growth area for talent um, because it's not only an un, um, unexplored area in some manufacturers, but there's just gonna, it's gonna bring a new skill set that we have not typically had uh, through an internal combustion side. Are you finding the right kind of skills for the autonomous vehicle within the region, or are you, do you have to go elsewhere to, to really hire people who respond to the needs of uh, uh, the changes of the new technology and manufacturing autonomous vehicles and the like? We've had very good success through the region, um, the Southeast region, um, and certainly Atlanta uh, with Georgia Tech offers a lot of great opportunity with people. So definitely the Southeast has come a long way since the 1970s. I can remember the Southeast in the 1970s, the, the creation of the I-85 corridor. Of course, you're not on the I-85 corridor. You made the choice of being on the other side somewhat. Uh, and then the general relocation of many, many automotive operations in the Southeast. Yeah. You think the plan will be ongoing from the vantage point of your, of your location and your experience? Well, we actually are on the I-85 corridor. Um, we're just- You are, I guess, yeah. We're on the Southern end of it, which- the Very is, end of it, yeah. Um, the supply base is developed all up and down that from, uh, all the way from Montgomery, all the way to Atlanta. Yeah. I think it is an advantage um, because it gives us a lot of avenues into other areas of not only the Southeast, but getting to points outside the Southeast. You're expecting right. more, more automobile firms to move into the Southeast? I guess there. <laughs> it's all about Georgia growth. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Seward. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Have a good day.